Really what I'm going to talk about is how we get to a 21st century model of, of uh, mental health within Australia. Okay, so, and you might wonder, probably quite good with Hugh Morgan having been in the previous session, but um, we've got a picture of an iron ore mine there. You might, the question is, what is Australia's um, greatest source of, of, of wealth? Well, um, it's, it's not actually iron ore or coal, it's actually our health. It's our greatest natural resource. And the one that's most seriously neglected in this area is the issue of mental health. And, and I think we've seen that even during the recent um, election campaign. It's, it was an issue, but um, there wasn't a lot of commitment, um, at, not, not, at least not across the board in, in uh, um, the political spectrum in this area. So that's, that's um, a key issue. And why is it important? Well, it affects every year four to five million Australians who experience mental ill health every single year. Um, one million of those are young Australians between the ages of 12 and 25. Suicide, it's World Suicide Prevention Day tomorrow, the 10th of September, <clears throat> and every four hours in Australia, someone dies from suicide. Every eight minutes, someone attempts suicide, and it's the greatest killer of Australians up to the age of 40, a 40% 40 bigger cause of death than the road toll, which we're inundated with day in, day out in terms of road safety messages and strategies to reduce the road toll. The road toll is one third these days what it was about 20 years ago. And I think we need to set a target like that for reduction of suicide because it, most of it is preventable, as Lifeline has recently emphasised. So these are just some figures. The big, the big figure to bear in mind is that while we saw all the fuss and, and, uh, and uh, flurry around the COAG Health Reform Summit in April, with Kevin Rudd sitting on hospital trolleys all around the country, 90% of, of uh, people with physical health problems get pretty good access to pretty good quality health care in this country. Only one third of people with mental health problems get access to any kind of care at all. And that drops to as low as 25% in young people and as low as 13% in young men. So it's the biggest health care issue for young people up to the age of 40. It's, uh, it's about 50% of the health burden up to the age of 25 and 75% of mental health problems emerge before the age of 25. So it's an issue, it's, a, it's a, an emerging adult issue. And that's where the innovation comes in. We have to develop systems of health care for this age group. And um, if you look at this slide, I've used this term this year to describe the situation. It's really a situation of apartheid. And it's not one group over here who are suffering discrimination, it's all of us. And, and just to give you an example of that, as a woman from Western Australia I spoke to recently who described her experience of um, um, discovering a breast lump, a small breast lump, and she went to the doctor, the, the doors of the health system just swung open to receive her, fast-tracked, you know. Um, the problem was treated expertly. She woke up, as she said, in a, in a hospital room full of flowers and friends and family. Um, she recovered fully and... Uh, it was a very positive experience, although obviously stressful. Six months later, she had a recurrence of her depressive illness, and she had a, the devil of a job getting into the same healthcare system that had treated her so well for the breast, the breast problem. And, you know, her experience was quite different. She was admitted ultimately, and she woke up in, this time in a much more meagre surroundings of, of, the, in, of the psychiatric inpatient unit um, with, you know, a collection of, of staff who were really struggling with their roles, um, not so many visitors, and certainly no flowers. So this is the same woman in the same healthcare system in the same city, experiencing quite different levels of access and quality of care. And this is being repeated all around the country. This year I've received hundreds and hundreds of letters and emails from people from every state and territory describing you know, tales of really um, miserable treatment, miserable access, and very poor quality uh, experiences. And that's not to, to demean the work of the people working in this really underfunded and, and uh, neglected uh, system of care. We've mainstreamed the old 19th century system into, this, into our mainstream health system, but we haven't resourced it, we haven't engineered it properly for the right age groups or the right, the right approaches and right cultures of care. So, <clears throat> and, and politicians have really just allowed this one to go through to the keeper. And that's changing because the Australian community is actually not satisfied with that. They really are, I think, understanding much more clearly that this is not an acceptable situation. So, 
That's the bad news. So what we're seeing is, as you see in this slide, um, too little, too late. You know, the, the, the prevention strategies are not there. The safety net of early intervention is not there like it is in cancer and heart disease. And the quality of the, of the system, as you, as you can see, there's those, those figures on the right there, the white figures pulling people out of the stream, many people not getting any help at all, and the people who are getting help are uh, getting it too late and when they've been really badly damaged as a result of untreated um, illness and ill health. So that's the situation in Australia. Many of you in the audience would, have, would be already aware of that from personal experience. And this is the pecking order, and this was absolutely on display in April, and probably at least on one side of politics through the election campaign. Mental health way down the bottom, not, not important, probably on the same level as leprosy and other similar sorts of uh, problems. Although leprosy is moving up. You know, last week there we, was a poll and leprosy has actually gone ahead. And now this is where the innovation, I'm going to shift to the more positive tone now, because there is in Australia tremendous capacity to fix this problem. We've got to understand the pattern of ill health across the population. And, and um, this is why the, the simplistic mainstreaming of mental health care that happened about 15 years ago um, in this country is not working. If you look at the pattern of, of disease or illness across the lifespan, you see that after 50, it's, it's pretty depressing news. Uh, all the, the serious chronic medical, medical diseases like heart disease, strokes, cancer, uh, dementia, all those things start to take off from the age of 50. And this is why we have our big teaching hospitals, our acute hospitals and our general practices, they're all set up to deal with that. Um, and if you go into those places, that's what you'll see. You'll also look down the other end of the lifespan, younger children below the age of 12, let's say, have got a cluster of serious medical diseases which need treatment, asthma, uh, childhood cancers and so on. And so that's why we have children's hospitals. In the middle, we've never been healthier, from puberty through to the mid-20s, emerging adults, adolescents, emerging adults, and even up to the, into the 40s, we've, we're very physically healthy. So 60% so of the health problems in the age group are mental health and substance use problems. And even up to the age of 40, it's about 36%. So, so the big issue of, 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 of emerging adulthood and even mature adulthood is mental health. But we do not have a system of care that, that's designed to respond to that. We're trying to provide mental health care through the main system and through a paediatric adult model, which works fine for physical illnesses, doesn't work for mental health care. So the, the adolescents and the young adults don't have a system that they feel comfortable using or engaging in, um, and um, certainly doesn't have the expertise or appetite to sort of, or the resources to deal with it at the moment. And that's why we see the statistics that I, that I mentioned before. Okay. So what's the solution? <clears throat> well, in trying to explain this and discuss this with, with general audiences this year, I've tried to use the example of the iPhone. Now, if you think back to 10 years ago, we used to have to carry around a computer, um, a phone, um, an address book, uh, a photo album, all probably about five or six or, or maybe more different you know, uh, tools or, or resources in our briefcases to actually function in the modern world. And then Steve Jobs stood up at one of the Apple Expos and, and held up the iPhone and said, actually, we can bring all of these things together through the power of the engineering and sophistication that sits behind the, the, the product, but we can bring them into the same place. And, and that actually is the one-stop shop. All of these things are now possible with, the, with this one piece of uh, innovation. And that's, what we ha that's the idea with youth mental health. We have to make um, the, the approach to youth mental health care um, as accessible as in, and as engaging and as stigma-free in the mental health sense as the iPhone. And that's what Headspace, uh, which is um, the national youth mental health program that's being rolled out now s slowly around Australia um, in 30 different locations, that's what it's about. It's about making youth mental health care accessible and uh, acceptable to young people. And, and uh, we've seen over 30,000 young people treated and, and provided with support in these settings over the last couple of years. So this is a piece of innovation which is it's really a, a cultural innovation. It's, it's, um, it's destigmatizing, it's actually a cultural change, because, but it's bringing the expertise in, in terms of um, a help for, for emerging mental health problems in young people 
to the community and to the young people directly. And we can, we can build on the idea of, of um, applications, and you can see what would, be the, what would be the things that would be in a headspace, what would be the, the, um, the tools or the applications that the young people might need for their, their health care or their health and social care. Well, the first thing would be we have to offer community awareness programs to actually educate the community about when and how to seek help because, you know, there's a threshold at which, you know, help seeking is appropriate and below which it's, it's just part of life. So that's the, the first thing, to educate people about when to seek help because a lot of people out there are suffering um, and not realising that they could, could be helped for the problem. They haven't understood that it is that kind of problem. Um, then there's e-health, that's another portal that young people are obviously very keen to be, to be using and it's a very powerful one. Um, and then there's youth-friendly GPs, psychological interventions and, and other, other key things. So you don't see podiatrists in the youth health service. You, know, you don't see physiotherapists. You see the different range of multidisciplinary care. And sitting behind that, this headspace portal, we have to have real expertise in, in youth mental health care. And that's where the specialised um, mental health system comes in. And that also has to be youth oriented and youth-friendly. And in the interest of time, I'll just flick through these quickly, but these are the sorts of things that are part of the backup system. So expertise in all these different domains has to be then available for the, the smaller group of young people who need more specialised help in these areas. And that's what you'd expect in, in other parts of the health system. And obviously substance use disorders is a key part. So what do these facilities look like? Um, well, this is their shop fronts, their youth drop-in sort of uh, centres at the front end, but sitting behind them, we do have this more specialised technical expertise, but in a multidisciplinary sort of way. And this is in Sunshine in Melbourne. It's a big warehouse of youth services. And what they're offering also is early intervention. They're offering, you know, what I was saying before about the woman with breast cancer. They're offering a place where, even though you're not sure if it's a serious problem or not, but you can get it checked out. You can actually um, intervene early, and if it's, if it's um, a, a, a transient or self limited problem, that's fine. You can be you know, helped on your way there. But if it is the early signs of something serious, we can be there and we can, we can change the course of that problem across the lifespan through that early intervention, just like we can in, in diabetes and heart disease and, and other areas too. This is in, in Ireland, another country that's innovating around this youth mental health idea too. It's in, in the city of Galway. It's called Headstrong there, not Headspace. This is our backup system at Parkville, the Origin Youth Health Service. Um, the, the similar sort of culture of care. And some other pictures of that service, which um, is, is the service that I work in. Sorry, we're a bit stuck here. So Headspace is now in 30, 30 locations. There'll be another 10 centres open in the next 12 months. It'll be building, and we probably need two or 300 of these around Australia um, over the next five to 10 years, um, so that they are locally accessible um, portals uh, for mental health care for young people. And in terms of getting this innovation um, embedded, I mean, what do we need? There's a couple of things, I suppose. One is leadership. We need support from the highest levels of government, from the business community, uh, from, the, from, I suppose, the whole spectrum of society for this issue. But more than anything else, we need the people. We need ordinary Australians to actually understand this is a matter of not just altruism and, and support for people who are, who are in trouble or suffering, but it could be any of us. It could be you, it could be someone in your family. Often when I've been doing these talks this year, I've asked the audience to indicate whether they themselves or someone in their family or someone very close to them has, has experienced mental ill health. And almost everybody in the room will put up their hand when I ask that question. So it is a matter that affects you or someone that you care about. And if, if, if it's not addressed, you'll be turning around looking for this kind of uh, expert help and it won't be there. And you'll find out that, that painful truth too late. So we need the public to get behind this and they are starting to do that. I don't know if you, if you agree with that, but I've certainly seen that very palpably this year. The media is very much behind it. It's in the public discourse. But we need investment. We need serious investment in this issue. And we need to turn off the tap so that 
we can reduce the numbers of people who are ending up with more persistent and, and long-term problems. And that can be done. We've got very good scientific evidence now that that is possible. It's just a matter of political will and community momentum. And that's what um, I think we're getting there in Australia. And we've got the chance to really lead the rest of the world in this because the rest of the world, thinking back to the previous discussion before the break, it's, it's mired in inertia in reform and mental health. Australia is innovative, but all too often it doesn't follow through with innovation and making it available to the whole of the population. And that's what we want to see happen with this issue. And on that note, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Please. Um, at the risk of appearing dumb, I just want some clarification. The iPhone apps, do they exist or is that a model for how we may move forward? Well, it's, it's, it's an analogy, I guess. Right, cool. I just want to make yeah. sure before I go home and tell my children to download them, they don't exist now, but when we meet in a year's time, who knows what will be there? Well, actually, things like uh, Reach Out, the website Reach Out and other websites, um, they're, they're, they're accessible right now for your, for your kids. Cool. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks. Many more questions to follow.